Hello there, welcome back, good to see you again. Today we're going to be reading together a few selected passages from the first chapter of the book Signals and Boundaries by the great AI pioneer um, John Holland. Right. So let me show you the cover again of the book. Here we have it. And you can also read down there the subtitles, right? Building Blocks for Complex Adaptive Systems. So before we start, let me recap a few things about the preface that we've read together last time. Uh, first, it's worth mentioning that uh, by the time John Holland wrote this book, it was uh, 2012, he was aged at the incredible 83 years of old, right? Which is a remarkable achievement by itself. Um, but not only that, he described it his mind state, his mindset as uh, incredibly motivated and uh, inspired for the fact that he was surrounded by, you know, his bright and creative students. And I think he was a living example for, for anyone trying to push, you know, the state of the art of a very difficult field, despite of uh, his advanced age which only shows how passionate he was about this topic, right? So let's honor his memory and let's get started, right? So the first chapter is titled The Roles of Signals and Boundaries, right? And I think it's gonna be difficult for you to uh, see anything from the camera, but nevertheless, I wanna start by reading the sentence um, in the second paragraph, page one. Despite a wealth of data and a description concerning different complex adaptive systems, we still know little about how to steer these systems. It is the stance of this book that widely applicable answers to questions about steering complex adaptive systems can be attained only by studying the origin and the co-evolution of signal boundary hierarchies much as the intricacies of ecosystems can be understood only by studying the origin and the coevolution of a species. So from the get-go, you can already see some analogies or generalizations. He, you know, uh, uh, looks into, you know, uh, uh, ecosystems and the concept of species. And here you can see a description of ecosystems as complex adaptive systems and that of species as um, um, signal boundary hierarchies, right? So we can get a sense of where he's going. So another uh, aspect that I want to highlight here is uh, the word steering, right? As opposed to say uh, controlling. So I think that was a statement from John Holland of uh, avoiding radical, at least the radical forms of reductionism, right? So let's take um, economics, for instance. In economics, um, we have uh, some very radical assumptions about how rational and, um, and how uh, the agents in an economical market have access to perfect and complete information, right? And from that naive assumption, we derive many different concepts such as demand and supply curves or um, the relationship between unemployment rates and uh, inflation. Um, and it's very dangerous to draw conclusions uh, from, from such equations and models, you know, without considering that uh, they're actually, you know, co-evolving factors and, you know, lots of unknowns that we are unaware of that are influencing the evolution of uh, any market and any economy, you know, for that sake. So I think, I think it's a, a more humble approach that John Holland is advocating here. Uh, he acknowledged that, you know, in a complex system, the best that we can do perhaps is to steer it, steer its evolution by intervening properly, by perhaps designing some proper policies to um, move the system towards desirable states and perhaps you know also avoid the undesirable and worst cases so he goes on and talks a lot about loops recirculation 
uh, mutual feedbacks, you know, and how all of these uh, vanishes our notions of causal if, and uh, causal relationships and cause and effect, which is another statement of how uh, difficult it is to apply standard mathematic, mathematics and the standard physics to model and understand uh, complex systems, right? So let's advance to page four. I think here there's a remarkable example on uh, how actual physical boundaries emerge in the world. So he was looking at the examples of the construction of the Great Wall of China and uh, that of uh, uh, the, the Hadrian's Wall in Britain, uh, built uh, during the Roman Empire. Um, well, it's unfortunate that uh, John Holland is not alive anymore to also perhaps say a few words about uh, Trump's wall <laughs> in the, the, the boundaries uh, with Mexico, uh, which is unfortunate, by the way. But nevertheless, uh, and, and, and also, you know, even the construction of castles, fort, fortified castles in the Middle Age. And, and John Holland goes on and, and says... In all three cases, there were unanticipated local effects, such as trade and fares at the portals. There is a kind of semi-permeability reminiscent of membranes controlling the flow of resources into and out of biological cells, in the same way that uh, there are trades and fares happening in the gateways of uh, these uh, big cities, you know, and uh, there's uh, these semi-permeability notions of uh, what's allowed to go in and uh, what should be kept outside, right? So it's a remarkable, uh, his ability of uh, going back and forth of uh, very different levels of abstraction, high order concepts, you know, um, and uh, linking uh, seemingly uh, disconnected fields into a coherent narrative, right? So you can see that a lot in his text. Um, and then he goes on and, uh, okay, so the walls serve as our physical boundaries, right? And what would be the signals in that case? So he continues. Um, some of the simple signals, such as moving troops to a border, recall the monkey's bluff. <laughs> like uh, when the monkey uh, issues uh, warning calls to, you know, uh, for, for the other monkey to, you know, uh, be aware of the presence of pred predators, you know. So it's a kind of signaling and uh, moving troops, you know, uh, it's uh, another, you know, way of saying, hey, um, you know, uh, we, we, we are acknowledging that uh, your empire is a threat to my empire and I'm, and I'm therefore fortifying, you know, my security and I'm ready to attack you if you cross the line. So, yeah, you, you, you can see that uh, in biology, you can see that uh, in complex human societies as well. Um, so, another passage that I want to read, let's uh, advance to page 8. So, it's about rainforests. So, John Holland asks, Why do tropical rainforests exhibit exquisite ecological innovations and great diversity, even though they grow on the worst poorest soils. Um, how can we preserve these ecosystems? In a rainforest, you may walk a hundred paces or more before you encounter two trees of the same species. And a single tree in a tropical rainforest may host more than 1,000 distinct species of insects. How do these distinct species manage to coexist in a single tree? Like a rainforest, a contemporary economy exhibits a great array of products and services. And, and he continues. So, again, another example of how he connects rainforests with ecosystems uh, and the uh, economy, right? A diversity of species, diversity of uh, products and services, you know, the scarcity of uh, products and services in a competitive market, market with the scarcity of nutrients in the rainforest because the rains, uh, the rain keeps uh, washing out every sort of uh, nutrients that are not available to, to, to the various species, right? So the species have to co-evolve filtering mechanisms to absorb um, the relevant nutrients and pass by, you know, byproducts that will be 
that will serve uh, as nutrients for other species and so on and so forth. So it's uh, so this kind of uh, analogies and parallels that uh, he's uh, very skilled uh, at. So let's advance now to page 12. So in page 12, he starts to uh, pinpoint um, the, the building blocks of uh, his uh, theory, which are namely diversity, um, recirculation, um, niches and hierarchies, and coevolution. And for each of these notions, he has a, a particular uh, tool, right, that we'll be uh, later using in the book to perform, you know, experiments, to showcase math mathematical models, and to propose methodologies for studying complex systems. So, he writes about diversity. The diversity of flora and fauna in, in a tropical rainforest is striking, especially for those who have experienced only temperate zone forests. The mystery of this great diversity is compounded by the fact that the rainforest grows on impoverished soil, um, the heavy rains leach all the nutrients from the soil, cascading them into the nearest stream. Why doesn't this impoverishment result in a forest in which a few species struggle for survival, as in a desert? What mechanisms make it possible for so many distinct species to coexist, right? So, I think he's describing here a very dynamical, fluid, liquid kind of a environment, right? Set of relationships that are mediated by, by really high-order events and are synchronized by high-order events such as uh, the weather, you know, um, the cycles of water and rain. Uh, so, you, you can see that here. And then, in page 13, he talks about circul recirculation, the second element of his theory. So he writes, the diverse organisms in a rainforest interact in a finely tuned way to keep nutrients from being lost to the leaching of the forest floor. As one example, consider a typical tree-dwelling bromeliad, a plant belonging to the same family as the pineapple. The bromeliad leaves form a basin that holds water. That basin acts as a sanctuary wherein various insects and frogs lay their eggs. The waste products of the growing larva, in turn, provide nutrients that are useful to the bromeliad. The bromeliad becomes an ecosystem itself, much like a spring pond in the temperature zone. It's easy to multiply these examples of recirculation. For instance, ants cut leaves and store them as a base for an underground fungus garden. Right? So, he's tying uh, this concept of uh, diversity you know, with uh, recirculation. So, since uh, resources are so scarce in the rainforest, so species have to be highly specialized to take advantage of every aspect of uh, the different kind of uh, nutrients and scarce nutrients that are available. So, I think he's up to something weird here, right? Okay, so in page 15, he now writes about niche and hierarchy. So he says, In Peru, small patches of rainforest exhibit the great variety of species typical of rainforests everywhere, but occasionally one encounters a long-sized patch almost entirely occupied by a single species of tree. According to local legends, such devil's garden are cultivated by an evil forest spirit. Until quite recently, there were only conjectures about a natural explanation for these patches. However, there is a species of ant that lives in small cavities in those monospecific trees occupying the garden. We now know that ants weed this garden by injecting formic acid into the seedings of other plant species, much as if they were attacking another insect. The ants probably attack all seedings that don't emit the scent of the favored tree. The signal detection is similar to the action of an Im immune system which destroys all cells that don't send the self-signal. By setting up this bounded niche, 
the ants create a locally ideal environment, right? <laughs> so, so here you see elements of uh, how niche formation depends on co-evolution already, you know, and not only that, uh, it has this remarkable insight and a, a, a parallel with the immune system with a kind of a select mechanism wherein the ants attacks the seedings of uh, different kinds of uh, tree species that, you know, are less adaptable to the ants needs, you know. So, one species ends transforming, you know, the diversity and creating a sort of a very specific local environment uh, which favors uh, that particular species' chance of survival. So, we, we used to think that only humans are capable of uh, transforming their, their environment uh, in such ways, but even very simple animals such as ants can, you know, co-evolve complex behavior to achieve uh, very similar results. So, it's mind-blowing, completely mind-blowing, mind-blowing. All right, so let's move to page now. Um, let's see. So, at page 18, he talks about coevolution. I think I won't be reading anything on coevolution, except that there's a very interesting passage here that I'll make reference later on, on Adam Smith's uh, <laughs> uh, Pink Factory. Uh, so, let's move forward and talk about mechanisms. So, make no mistake, John Holland was a very competent and ferocious scientist. Uh, you know, so he is not the kind of guy who be attacking, uh, you know, uh, reductionism. He, he might advise against uh, the radical forms of it, but, you know, this is someone from the get-go of uh, his masterpiece book is advocating for better understanding the mechanisms of a complex adaptive system. So he's actually saying that uh, you know we need to get our simplifications and set of rules of how complex adaptive systems works. You know, right? Um, so he has this to say about that. Um, the, in the examples considered so far, signals and boundaries are made up of a multiplicity of interacting parts, ranging from the molecules that define membranes to the utterances that are sequenced to yield spoken language. This common ground in interacting parts, combined with the categories of interaction just examined, diversity, recirculation, niche, and coevolution, leads us directly to a rapidly growing field of study, the study of complex adaptive systems. Now, the components of a CAS, as abbreviated, are bounded subsystems, that is, agents, that adapt or learn when they interact. Markets, languages, and biological cells all fit the CAS framework, the agents being, respectively, buyers and sellers, speakers, and proteins, right? Um, so, now he talks about the flu vaccine, so how, you know, we fail to pinpoint the, 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 the specific mechanisms of seasonal flu epidemics, and since we don't understand how, you know, the flu virus mutates precisely, and how it co-evolves to be resistant to, you know, several kind of a, a viral drugs, you know, then we, we, we are very reactive, you know, in uh, improving our, our treatments. So, he used this example uh, to highlight the importance of uh, understanding mechanisms, right? Well, what else can be said from the first chapter? All right, so here we are at page 23, and uh, he's writing about unification of uh, all of these concepts. So he says, there are two broad questions that apply to the full range of signal boundary systems. 
The first one, what are typical steps in the formation and evolution of the complex signal boundary interactions involving generalists, for instance, craftsmen, and specialists, for instance, workers on a production line? So this is a man who is obsessed about how nature and uh, human societies in general go from generalists to specialization, right? And to the best of my knowledge, he's uh, the first author that I've encountered that uh, puts this problem uh, as the central focus of his theory, right? So how do we explain the emergence of the production line? No. Uh, so in the example of uh, the, the the flat uh, pins, you know, in the early days of the industry revolution, uh, it required uh, high levels of craftsmanship, crafts, craftsmanship, right? It was a very cost costly process, and therefore pins uh, were very expensive. And all of a sudden, this knowledge that was concentrated in a few professionals started to be decentralized and spread it, but in a very specialized manner, right? And uh, each man and woman would be uh, responsible for different parts of the process. And uh, this was responsible for bringing down the cost of fabrica fabrication and the price of the straight pins for a factor of 10, right? So it's uh, one early example of uh, the industry revolution. So John Holland believes that uh, this may be explained by coevolutionary accounts, right? So this guy is not kidding. <laughs> and the, 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 the second broad question, right, that he poses is what mechanisms generate the signal boundary interactions, right? Okay, so page 25, he delineates his toolkit, classifier systems for defining signal process programs. So not surprisingly, he has a computation account, right, for describing signal processing. Tags for directing signals. Tagged urns for defining semi-permeable boundaries. And this is a probabilistic model, a Markov base one that he uses to model semi-permeable boundaries. Very interesting. Genetic algorithms to provide uh, for the adaptation and co-evolution of agents. And finally, dynamic generated systems that provide a grammar for the framework and brings mathematical tools to bear. All right. What else? So in page 29, we can find uh, some uh, probabilistic particle physics models that he advocates for modeling uh, signal exchange, reactions, um, with an emphasis on conservation. So if we want to model um, chemical reactions, for instance, we need to add an additional role uh, in that uh, the strings, the input strings, uh, the symbols that appear at the input strings are preserved, you know, in the output strings. So that's a not very common requirement for general purpose computation, but uh, he has a specific mathematical model that can account for that. And then he has a very nice passage that I want to read for you at page 30, which is, in networks, building blocks are pieces, like communities, that can be reused in many different contexts. For, in for instance, in metabolic networks, the Krebs citric acid cycle, consisting, consisting of 80 protein catalysts, is a building block found in every aerobic organism, from carrots to elephants. It serves as a kind of a fundamental Lego block from which many complicated metabolic networks can be constructed. Right? So, this is, this is the guy who invented genetic algorithms. So, he'll be using crossover operations, crossbreeding, uh, you know, to explain the emergence of uh, increasingly complex uh, metabolic networks and everything else, right? Which makes sense, which makes sense. All right. And finally, 
uh, he returns to the theme of specialization in page 31 uh, at the end of the chapter and I think it's worth reading this. Specialization is a typical outcome of coevolution and crossbreeding. As the system adapts, inefficient single-stage processes are replaced by sequences of more specialized processes. Adam Smith's example of the pin factory illustrates the replacement of a one-stage process with a multiple-stage process. A multi-skilled craftsman is displaced by a sequence of specialist agents, each specialist adapting and refining some particular skill of the generalist, such as drawing wire or adding a head to the pin. For the process to work, each specialist must receive input from a predecessor agent and pass the process input into a successor. The pin factory, though a special case, illustrates three factors in signal boundary interactions. New boundary boundaries distinguish the specialists, resources flow from specialist to specialist, and signals synchronize interactions. It is instructive that nearly 300 years after Adam Smith highlighted his adapted transformation, we still lack a, a general theory of the origin of production lines, right? <laughs> so I guess he's advocating for a sort of a uni universal Darwinism, the same way that Richard Dawkins have said in his uh, uh, self, uh, uh, you know, uh, selfish gene, right? So I think we can explain the evolution of the cosmos, you know, of production lines, and eco biological ecosystem by using natural selection metaphors. So, genetic algorithms, very powerful to make no mistake about it, right? Um, and, 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 and that's it. And, and then he finishes up the chapter by, by sketching uh, the, the basic math and delineating a sort of a ideas for a research program in introducing the content of uh, the other chapters, right? So, that's it for today. I think you became... Uh, enough interested in buying the book, right? Uh, for me, it was a, an almost enlightening uh, and spiritual experience to remember and uh, be rec and be reconnected with uh, you know the studies that was that I was performing during my masters and during my PhD uh, degrees, and I guess that uh, the main lesson that we can learn from John Holland in general is that. You know, if we want to, to perform innovative and um, high quality engineer, allow yourself to, to question, allow yourself to go to the core of your discipline, you know, and try to really understand the fundamentals, right? Avoid the temptation of shrinking your time horizon and just utilizing whatever tool is out there and allow yourself to be the creator of your own toolkit, right? So you can see that inevitably you become a better engineer, okay? So with this message, I want to thank you all and uh, let's keep doing that. Let's keep reading this book as well as other books in the follow-up videos, all right? See you.